Hello, friends. This is David, your traveling tutor. I'd love to welcome you back to my continuing video about the island of Guam. This video focuses on the War in the Pacific National Historic Parks. Guam has a lot of smaller parks and cool areas, but today I'm going to show you three different historic national parks. The first one is going to be the World War II Museum. Then we're going to look at the Agat Tagan Point Beach. And finally, Asan Beach. And these beaches have historical significance from World War II. Let's get started. This is uh, a park right next to the Hilton. Not sure what the name of it is, but uh, it's right on the beach. It is pretty cool. Seems like a really nice area to hang out, have picnics, and uh, Hang out at the, uh, the huts right by the beach. Duman Bay Preserve. I was also told that the name of this place was called Yipao Beach. Yipao Beach. My favorite flower. What is this, friends? Do you know what type of ear, what kind of fruit this is on this tree? I have no clue what kind of tree this is. <laughs> Billy says it's got candy. Comment and let me know if you know what type of tree this is. Okay, so this is Tumon Bay. It's actually a preserve. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Looks like this might come to a dead end in the road. Yeah, pretty rough. Oh, it's not that bad. So yeah, friends, the road really does run out right here. And, uh, I can imagine that this is a little bit more rough when the tide comes in. I'm just going to do a U-turn and head back right now. Looks like Hermit didn't make it. Alright, another stop on the uh, Guam visit is the War in the Pacific National Historic Park. And it's remembering and honoring U.S. Armed Forces who fought in World War II. Quite interestingly, over here, the submarine, I think this is a Japanese submarine for World War II. Not very big inside, and I'm talking from experience. So yeah, we're gonna head inside, take a look and see what is in this national park. It's a Japanese two-man submarine, like I thought. Uh, ran aground at Guam uh, 1944 while on a mission to attack America's shore facilities. The battle for Guam had ended more than a week before this submarine washed ashore. Are you together? No. Oh, okay, okay, you're gonna listen to my little spiel. Oh my gosh. All right. You're okay. on. So welcome. Welcome to the National Park Service Visitor Center. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, the, this is our World War II museum and we exist to honor the people and the places that were here during World War II. We have our exhibits here. We also have a 10 minute video that we can show for you. Um, and it gives you kind of a, a, a broad base of information before you start to see the exhibits. And so we definitely recommend that. And then here is our bookstore managed by our Civic Historic Parks, which is actually us. Okay. And all the proceeds that uh, we make off of our bookstore sales go back to the education 
an interpretation of the National Park Service. So welcome. This is a great uh, map of Guam. It looks like it's from 1944. Uh, it's quite a bit busier today than it's probably on the map, but you can see up in this area is where the Navy operates right now and uh, staying over in Timon Bay. So we had to drive south along the, uh, the western coast of Guam to get to this National Historic Park. So once you're inside of the, uh, this National Park, you can walk around. There's a lot of information about Guam and how Guam participated in the uh, Second World War. So come in and walk around and you can check out everything that happened to Guam during the Second World War, which was quite a bit, very significant. Friends, I'm here today with Gina Lewis. I'm a park ranger with the War in the Pacific National Historical Park. And thank you for joining us. Could you tell me about the submarine? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is actually a Type C Japanese midget submarine. Uh -huh. uh, so a lot of people think that it's an American submarine, but it's actually a, a Japanese sub. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually one of the rarest artifacts that we have from World War II here mm -hmm. on Guam. Okay. And the reason is the mission of the, the nature of the mission of this submarine. So this submarine is usually attached to a Japanese warship uh -huh. and it goes ahead of the Japanese warship um, to remove any uh, enemy threats that prevents it from getting from point A to point B. Like maybe the, um, the water mines yes, or the... Yes, yeah, underwater mines or even other ships or other submarines that okay. might be in, their, in, uh -huh. in, their, in that area they're trying to get to. Yeah. Um, so when the two Japanese sailors or submariners that would get into this sub, when they would get in it, the, the likelihood of them coming back was very low. Mm -hmm. So it carried two torpedoes. Uh, in the sub, but they actually consider which are right yep. in the front. It looks they like they actually consider the entire submarine marine a third torpedo. So you know if they ran out of torpedoes, then and they still had any enemies in, in their way that they would sacrifice themselves. Uh, sort of like kamikaze, kamikaze pilots. And, yeah, and, yeah. And uh, use the submarine to get rid of uh, enemy targets. Okay. And so, like I said, the nature of the mission of the sub actually made it so that about 2,000 or so subs that were made during the 1930s and 1940s, a lot of them that were used are actually in broken pieces underwater mm. uh, or have in pieces floated to other parts of the world. Okay. This submarine has an interesting history and the reason why it's still intact is that in August after Guam was, <laughs> was declared <laughs> secure from, from the Japanese and liberated by the U.S., this submarine actually floated into a beach on the eastern side of the island. Um, and it raised a lot of alarm because, of course, it was it's, precedes a Japanese warship. So, and it's um, supposed to be out in the water doing exactly, its thing. <laughs> yeah. And so they're thinking, well, the subs here, maybe there's a Japanese warship or a couple Japanese warships out there ready to come in again and maybe try to attack one mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, so that set off a, um, alarm bells. But um, once they realized there was no threat, no other Japanese warships in the area, U.S. military members went to go and investigate the sub. And another interesting thing was there was two Japanese submariners that were inside the sub at the mm. time. Alive? Alive. Okay. Yeah. So what's interesting about it too is that sailors were so uh, fierce about protecting the sub and also not wanting to become prisoners of war, they actually held off. Uh, the U.S. military for getting access to the sub for three days. So when I was out here, I asked them to touch the submarine. Uh, and they feel it, and they, they it's feel hot. It's hot. Yeah. On the outside. So I asked them, imagine what it was like for these Japanese sailors for three days in that sub. I... It on its side, it's not upright. It's right. On its side. It's tip sideways. Uh, it, there's not a lot of airflow. This is a short, we were short range mission. Mm -hmm. So of course they didn't bring with them a lot of. Sure. So this is a really nice picture here. It shows the torpedoes. These are all batteries that were in the sub that would be energized 
by a diesel engine uh, that would run everything. And then this middle part of the sub, this was the only place that uh, a, an adult man would be able to stand and sit comfortably oh my because it was pretty cracked with you know all this Terminators other equipment. In the front, batteries, yes, batteries, in front, and back, engine, and, and everything. Diesel. So yeah, there's not a lot of room, you know, yeah, and, right. and you couldn't even stand in, in this areas right uh, there. Yeah. yeah, so that just that middle space below the conning tower is where they live for three days. Yeah, yeah. And what it was on a site, <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't that tough, Yeah, sure. but they eventually surrendered. Uh, actually, we don't know oh. what happened, so. Maybe they the opened the hatch and all left. The documentation is we have is that they held it for three days and there was two Japanese inside. We don't know if they were killed in action while they were trying to get uh, access to this the sub mm -hmm. or if they surrendered with oh, okay. and became preserved or so there's more mystery behind it, you know, um, Interesting. you don't know what happened to them. Yeah. So we've had experts on submarines come from different parts of the world to come look at this submarine because like I said, it's a very rare artifact from World War II, yeah. being that it's the only type of sea midget submarine mm -hmm. of its kind that's still intact. Interesting. And then it has an interesting story behind it as well. This has been many different colors <laughs> over the years. Uh, it hasn't been under the control of the National Park Service and so around the late 80s, it was at a beach for some time. Then it was also like a decoration in front of the Navy bachelor's housing. Okay. Um, and then we acquired it and we placed it here. It used to be gray, it used to be white. They actually used to even have stickers on the top of uh, the tower is at. Yeah. Oh, I do see it, yeah. And number 51. 51. Like across it. And I, we okay. don't even know what the 51 means. So it's been decorated, in, you know, throughout the time. But when we brought it back, we wanted to put it back to its original design. And of course, this would be the would original black. because mm -hmm. it would be much more camouflage. Yeah. We want it to be as camouflage as possible. Yes, definitely. From the other uh, visitor center that we were at, continued south, once you get to the naval naval base you have to take a left but just keep following the road south from there and you'll come to the war in the pacific national historic park which is run by the national park service got a little bit of rain so it's a little wet outside but gonna check it out Again, friends, it's pretty wet out, but at least the sun is out now. Looks like they have some bathrooms, which is nice. That's right at the entrance. Okay, yeah, if you see any bombs, recognize they could blow up. seems like this park, until I get there, I, I don't know what's on the beach, but it looks like there's a gun emplacement here. But Guam was taken by the Japanese during World War II. It was taken back, recaptured by the Americans. And uh, the Americans at the time were worried about the Japanese reinvading Guam because it was such a strategic point in the Pacific. It was uh, one of the places where you could um, land planes, send in supplies, stuff like that. Ga'an Point in Agat was part of the southern landing site of the United States forces in the liberation of Guam in July of 1944. This area was strategically chosen in order to help secure the peninsula to the north. <laughs> Covered by trees, probably not that effective anymore. A Japanese anti-aircraft gun. Seen better days, friends. Take a look at the end of this gun. It's beautiful down here. Look at this beach. Yeah, nice. 
pretty nice. I think I want to go swimming. The plan was to overtake the point where the entire beachfront at Agat could be used to offload supplies and equipment that were critical for the inland advance. The first wave of the southern landing force invaded Guam in Agat. The young men in the assault were part of the first Provisional Marine Brigade, which consisted of the 4th and the 22nd Marine Regiments. The fighting at Agat was severe, particularly during the first night as the Japanese launched a major counterattack. Ultimately, it took three days to establish dominance on the southern beachhead. Three days later, the report was that the U.S. had lost near 1,000 brave fighting soldiers. The total casualties during this battle from the Japanese were were estimated around 11,000 men. At the site of Agat Ga'an Point, there was fierce fighting, but if you visit this spot, not much remains. But what remains is the memories of soldiers that, that fought bravely here and liberated the Chamorro people. Continuing um, taking the other path, looks like this might be a bunker concrete bunker that the, the Japanese would have set up for defense. Yeah, you can see the, the shape of the window there. Definitely for defending and shooting out. It's pretty, I can't even stand up in here though. Wow, look at that beach over there. can see the bunker just kind of built into uh, a rock structure over there. The battle for a rote, I think that's how you would say it. You can see the American Landing Beach right down here. 30 July 1944 and this was set up as a deterrent to the U.S. assault force. This is a point, it seems pretty strategic. And as I'm taking a look here, a lot of concrete barriers. But again, who knows if this was from World War II or exactly what it was used for. And that's where I walked along the beach earlier. It's like a tunnel down there, possibly a natural cave used as a tunnel. If you walk up this path, heading up here, you can see another bunker above the other one, set up on top of the rock formation. So it looks like there was a couple of fortification points that the Japanese had set up for defending this part of Guam. Nature has now taken over. So a couple of highlights at this national park area, a couple of guns, a couple of fortifications. There might have been a lot in years past, but not much here. Just a old time remembrance of rusting metal, of days gone by and memories of World War II in the Pacific on the island of Guam. But it's nice that they have this set up for people to remember because if we forget, History repeats itself. Another historic beach area. Yeah, it looks like this is where the Marines landed July 21st, 1944. I'm gonna head out and see what that is. Guam has some historic landmarks, but there's not a lot of artifacts. Um, you know, like I'd expect to see some tanks, stuff like that, but it was probably, you know, taken after the war and repurposed, but it would be so cool if you could you know, see the types of landing amphibious vehicles or whatever they had 
And over there you can see the uh, downtown area. You can see Two Lovers Point off to the left of that. Downtown area, hotels, and then right over there, Two Lovers Point. And I can see why this would be a good place for the uh, Marines to come and land. There's a reef out in the distance, a breaker, very shallow all the way out to that point. So a good place to land Marines and the equipment that they needed to attack the Japanese on the island of Guam. In 1892, Asan Beach was, interestingly enough, the site of a leper colony until it was destroyed by a typhoon. Then in the year 1901, it was a prison camp for exiled Filipino insurrectionists. Asan Beach contains many historic resources preserved from the war. There are Japanese pillboxes, and on the backside of the point, two Japanese gun emplacements were reinforced with metal beams, and you can see this as I walk around. I'm sure with some metal detecting out here, you could probably find a lot of artifacts from the 1940s, 1944, 1945, And then further down the coast, you can see where the, uh, uh, the U.S. Navy base is, over there. But in between, <laughs> this area, there's not much going on here. It's pretty rural. Seems like it's just the hermit crabs living here right now. Also on Sun Beach is a 20 centimeter coastal gun, which remains today, and you can see that. The U.S. Landing Monument is also along the beach and is dedicated to the brave men who fought here. Again, Asan Ridge and Asan Beach contains numerous pillboxes, caves, and tunnels. The War in the Pacific Park, presented by Commander Submarine Force U.S. Pacific Fleet, in memory and recognition of the courage and sacrifice of submariners whose heroism during World War II contributed significantly to the liberation of the Pacific. And in place here, I think there used to be a Mark 14 torpedo. <laughs> no longer there. Mm -hmm.